my family. They're, they were being treated really badly by the Russians. So these Germans were kind of grouchy people. Uh, if you wander around East Germany, which you couldn't at the time, I couldn't anyway, I was in uniform. Uh, if you wandered around East Germany, it's uh, real cloudy most of the time. Germany itself is very rarely sunny, and this is one of the reasons, I think we talked about this, one of the reasons why when the sun comes out, the Germans take their clothes off to get a suntan. Uh, well, they're just trying to get vitamin D, right? They're not trying to display themselves to people. They don't really care about that, not that much. Uh, anyway, they were just trying to trying to get vitamin D. So the, especially in East Germany, Northern Germany is real cloudy because it's right there on the Baltic. Um, I was there in, in July and it snowed in Bremerhaven. I was <laughs> taking my car up to be taken back to the States. Yeah, it was, it was in July, end of July, beginning of August, and it snowed. It was so cold. And it was warm in the part of Germany where I lived. I lived over in, uh, near Ramstein, near Zweibrücken. And it was warm down there, so I didn't have that many clothes on. Oh, I was froze to death, I'll tell you what. And they don't, they don't use heaters in Germany. Um, the, only house, the only room in the house that they heat is the, is the kitchen. And the only reason they heat that is because of the uh, stove, the oven. So they'll turn on the oven to, to warm the house. And sometimes they'll cook something in the, in the oven, but uh, it's the only, it's the only uh, warm uh, room in the house. The other thing about Germans is the, they use uh, comforters. Uh, so they use these, these feather comforters to, to cover up with, and they're like this, this thick. I mean, and, and it's, uh, it's uh, goose feathers. They're nice, it's really warm, but of course the, the, the room isn't being heated, so you don't want to leave out a glass of water and it'll freeze during the night, which isn't funny at all. Uh, I know, it's not funny. Uh, so every morning you'll see the Germans uh, taking their comforters out. They, don't, they can't wash them because they're, you know, they're this thick for one thing, and what are you going to put them in to wash them? So what they do is they put them out to air. They air, air them out every morning. So they'll throw them out on the, on the windowsills. So all their, all their windows are big windows. I mean, they're like this. And they're actually that tall. <clears throat> the other thing about the Germans, uh, at least in the part of Germany where I was, uh, they had um, uh, blinds. Really? Everybody has blinds. Well, these were blinds that could stop a bullet. <laughs> so roll them out, and they were thick metal like this. Oh man! So I lived in a house that was like armor plated. It was really kind of interesting. Anyway, so the East Germans are grouchier than the people from West Germany that, or West Berlin. The East Berliners were were grouchier than the people people from West Berlin. They had uh, what they refer to as learned helplessness. Uh, they were behind the wall. <clears throat> the famous. Uh, uh, iron Curtain, uh, and they couldn't get out. They wouldn't let them leave. Uh, they couldn't get a, a pass to leave because if they left, they, they wouldn't come back. So they, they just kept them in there. Uh, now the West Berliners, actually, I, I'm not exactly sure what was going on with the West Berliners. I'm not exactly sure if they, if they crossed the border or not. I don't think they did. The problem was that Berlin was in East Germany, but West Berlin was part of the West. East Berlin was, of course, part of the East, but in order to get out of Berlin, you had to either fly out or take a train out. And if you were German, you couldn't take a train out. But if you were American, you could. Uh, we were there three times. I went in there three times. And I went uh, by car once, by train once, and we flew in once. So. I actually drove through East Germany, East Germany to get to East Berlin, which was a lot of fun. So I show you this picture and you, you look at these people's faces, you don't see anybody smiling. Well, you see he's smiling. I don't know what he's so, so happy about. These are, these are East Berliners and they, they were normally pretty up, upset with just about everything. Is that chair okay? I don't know why. Is there something wrong with it? No, no, no. I just want you to be comfortable. Yeah, it's very comfortable. Okay. <laughs> Like, it's a trip. <laughs> yeah, well, that so, comes later on in the class. Okay. 
<laughs> Snippy and Marcus in 2005 argue that upper class of, uh, uh, upper middle class Americans are raised to favor choices and to express themselves through their choices. So we were just talking about the Germans who don't really make choices. Uh, if you go to, into a German store, they probably have one of whatever that you're looking for. And uh, if you ask them, well, do you have anything better? They'll say there's nothing better than something sold in Germany. So don't even, don't even <laughs> breach that subject. <sighs> Everything the Germans have is the best. Like, uh, you know, Mercedes-Benz. Oh, you got it. Okay. Mercedes-Benz, best car on the road. Just ask the Germans. Uh, BMW. Best car on the road. Just ask the Germans. Uh, what else is best? Siemens. Uh, Blue Punkt. The uh, Blau Punkt. I'm sorry, Blau Punkt. The radio is the best radio in the world. Bose. Bose is the best radio in the world. It's German. Of course it is. All the best optics in the world are German. <clears throat> if you want a good uh, washing machine, uh, buy a German washing machine. I have a Bosch washing machine. And if, the, if there was a German around, they'd say, oh, yeah, that's much better than Maytag or, you know, whatever. They're funny people. Anyway, but we're Americans, and we want choices. So when we go to Walmart, we don't want to see one thing on the shelf. We want to see five things on the shelf so that we can make a choice, so that we can decide what the hell we want, right? Where was I? I was in uh, Clinton, Iowa. Uh, my my uh, basement was flooding, so I needed a sump pump. My sump pump had given out. Uh, so I went to get a sump pump. Well, they only had one brand at, uh, where did they go? Oh, Home Depot. They only had one brand. <clears throat> and being not real bright, I just went ahead and bought that one brand. Guess what? That damn thing didn't work. And then I went back, and the second one didn't work. So then I went to Blaine's Farm and Fleet, and they had five different types of sump pumps. And I picked one, and it works. Now, what does that tell you? I don't know. Maybe I don't want to know what that has to do with Home Depot. You know what else they did? They got me to, to, uh, to get one of their uh, uh, credit cards. I got 20% off that sum pump that didn't work. Not a bad deal. Well, it wasn't that much of a waste of money. Feel the comments of this. This is so weird. Isn't that strange? It's like human flesh or something. <laughs> okay, so what do we do? We're talking about middle class. We like to make our choices. They learn to respond quite negatively when they believe that they do not have any choice in a situation. They want to make a choice. They don't want one car. They don't want to take that blue car, damn it. They want to take whatever damn color, color car they want. That's the way we are. We want, to, we want to decide what we want. We don't want to be told what, what we have to take. But in other countries, they don't care. It doesn't bother them. They don't need choices. But we do. We're Americans. We're different. Uh, you guys don't really understand working class uh, Americans, uh, mainly because you don't live around a factory town. If you lived around a factory town, you'd probably understand working class Americans. Uh, I grew up in a factory town. I went to school, they, they educated me to be a factory worker. They edu educated everybody to be a factory worker. <clears throat> and I became a professor instead, damn it. <laughs> anyway, but uh, I married uh, the daughter of a factory worker. My brother married the, the daughter of a factory worker. Uh, and we've been suffering from it ever since. Uh, factory workers are different. Working class people have different ideas. They feel like uh, they don't know what's going to happen next week. They might get fired. So they need to make sure they have all the happiness they can get today. Uh, so those guys, they get a paycheck on Friday. By Monday, they don't have any money left. <clears throat> and hopefully they bought groceries before they spend all their cash. But uh, that's the way my, my first wife was. She was, well, that's, one of the reasons why she stabbed me. She stabbed me because <laughs> she stabbed me because she spent all my money. And I said, what the hell are you doing? You spent all of our money. I'm not going to get paid again until the end of the month. And she got mad because I got mad. And 
she stabbed me a couple times, different two, a couple different times. And then she's arguing with me that night. I fell asleep. <clears throat> I know, that's appalling. To fall asleep and somebody's yelling at you. But I fell asleep and <clears throat> I woke up with a knife in my chest. Uh, but she's a working class. She was a working class child. She was working class American. Um, working class Americans grew up learning that much of what people encounter in life is beyond their control and that a good way to maintain one's independence is to emphasize one's integrity and resilience during tough times. The other thing that uh, working class people will do is, like I said, they will live for today, not for tomorrow. They don't worry about tomorrow. They just worry about today. And they, you know, they would uh, uh, buy, buy stuff, they would buy whole piles of stuff, they'd buy stuff they didn't need. Boats. Why in the world do they need boats? They couldn't swim. It didn't make any sense. My, my father-in-law bought a, bought a boat. He didn't even fish. I don't know what that was all about. <clears throat> Weird guy. Okay, anyway, that's working class Americans. Uh, you remember Ash. Ash in 1962 did his con uh, conformity uh, uh, tests where he had an individual. The whole class were Confederates and they had one guy that they were trying to figure out if they could make him conform. That was what they were trying to do. <clears throat> and in most cases, they worked. He conformed at least one out of 12 times he, he conformed. And that's enough. You just need to get people to, uh, to, to follow what you want them to do one time. Sometimes that's all you need. This is what was going on in Germany during World War II. A lot of people say, well, I didn't have anything to do with the, with the uh, genocide of the Jewish people. Uh, well, probably not, but you probably knew about it. Oh, no, no, no. Even the people that were working there said, well, I was just following orders. I was conforming. And actually, the whole Nazi movement and, and the fascist movement in Germany was, a, was a, an exercise in conformity. I just read a book about that. <clears> the <throat> lady was a, uh, was a guard at a, uh, at a female concentration camp, or a concentration camp with females. Uh, and she let women die. And she selected women to die. So she went to trial uh, after they caught her, <clears throat> and she was convicted and put in prison for life. And, um, <laughs> okay, she was put in, that's not funny, she was put in prison for life, and uh, they let her out uh, for good behavior after, uh, after 18 years. And the day before she was, she was uh, read, uh, scheduled to get out of prison, she hung herself. Why do you think she hung herself? They didn't actually answer that question in the book, so... You guys, help me with this book. Help me understand this book. Why, why did she kill herself? Why did she hang herself? Because if she went out, then people would kill her. No, it was Germany. Uh. <laughs> I was there 70, from 79 through 82, and I'll tell you what, I ran into Nazis all the time. It was interesting. They're different. They, they think different in a different manner. Now they're having problems with the neo Nazis in, in Germany. So, why in the world did this lady hang herself? It didn't have to do with the fact that uh, she wasn't in the United States. She wasn't in it like in Israel where all the Jewish people are going to crucify her or, or something. She was in Germany. Germans wanted to try, have tried to forget. So, why in the world did she hang herself? This is sticky. We know who to blame, too, don't we? Yeah, we're going to blame that. We're going to blame the, the lady that spilled that. Who, uh, so why, why would she hang herself? Why do you think? I couldn't live with herself. Couldn't live with herself. Guilty. She felt guilty. You know, that's what I figured. She felt guilty. She felt like she didn't deserve not to be, not to be in prison. Uh, or, yeah, or she needed to be punished. And now they're going to let her go. Um, it was a really weird story. It's a story about a 15-year-old uh, boy that uh, meets a 31-year-old woman who uh, seduces him. I don't know. It was kind of a mutual seduction situation. So they were together for an extended length of time, and then she left. She's 31. He's 15. 
Eventually, it turned out she was the guard. She was the female guard of the prison. And she went to trial, and he was, went to her trial. He was a lawyer. Uh, he was in law school, and uh, he saw the trial. Why are we talking about this? Oh, conformity. Okay, conformity. So Nazis, uh, well, Germans, uh, it's not like they said, Hitler, you're not here. You're incorrect. There were too many Germans that were saying that that was the way it should be. They needed to conform. Germans are very conforming people. They always follow the rules, no matter what the rules are, no matter what the situation is. This is how bad Germany, uh, Germans are. They, they have those traffic cameras. They were the first people to come up with the, this concept of traffic cameras. Uh, in Germany, if you, and uh, uh, Tiffany's uh, writing a, a book, or a, book a, a paper about the Germans. Did you read that, that they even follow the rules when yeah. there's nobody around? <laughs> They really do. They follow the rules, and it pisses people off so much if you break the rules, they'll come after you and they'll yell at you for breaking the rules if somebody sees you. If you break the rules here, I'd walk across the grass all the time. <laughs> I walk across the dirt all the time. Nobody tells me, good off our grass. There was a blade out there somewhere. I know, and you probably stepped on it and killed it. Nobody tells me that. But in Germany, if they, if they said not to, to walk on the grass, somebody would yell at you. They would, they would chastise you. They'd shake their finger in your face. That's the way Germans are. As interesting as that is. Anyway, that's conformity. It has to do with conformity. But we're conforming, too. We are Americans. And sometimes we, well, I mean, do you stop at a stop sign even if there's no cars coming? Yeah. No, never? <laughs> Just blast right through? <laughs> 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 what was what was the movie? Oh, the Mexican, uh, with uh, with uh, pretty boy. What's his what's his face? Uh, Angelina Jolie's ex-husband, Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt's in the Mexican. <laughs> uh, he's sitting in a, at a traffic light, and he's sitting there for a really really long time. He keeps looking down. He can't see anything. He starts to pull out in this this truck comes blasting through. That would happen to me. Anyway, conformity, even despite the fact that we're Americans and we, uh, we, we do what the hell we want to do, 75% of the American subjects uh, conformed at least one time. Some people like to conform all the time. Now, if we did this same study in Canada, we wouldn't get the same results. Canadians ain't the same as us. They're more conforming than we are. That's the way they're taught in school. Remember, their educational system is, is more based on eight of the English uh, educational system, where conformity is, is more common in that, uh, in that society. Ash conducted other experiments uh, dealing with conformity and found that there are several consequences to not conforming. For one thing, that people might laugh at you. I mean, if, if somebody, if one person says one thing and everybody else says something else, everybody else may laugh at you for, for having this idea. <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why we conform in the United States. The other reason was because people tend to actively dislike those who don't conform. So you make enemies by not conforming. You need to be like everybody else. There's one guy in my, in, in, I, I, I live in Hogan Housing, of course, there's one guy there that doesn't ever try to pin up his dogs. Just one guy. One guy. And I'm not sure how much people like him, because he will not, he doesn't even try. At least I try. My dogs escape all the time, but I, at least I try. They're probably out. Well, they're probably, they probably went home with the rain. <laughs> uh, I let them out to pee. A uh, meta-analysis of conformity shows uh, that while Americans show a great deal of conformity, people from collectivistic uh, cultures conform even more, especially when they are conforming to their in-groups. And of course, if, you're, if you were ever in the military, and there are only two of us in here that were, right? There's only two of us. Okay. When, when you're in the military, you've got to conform, because if you don't conform, you're in big-time trouble, and you'll never make it out of basic training. <laughs> They'll give you all kinds of interesting, they'll, they'll do a psych about and find out that uh, there's something wrong with you. And that is the end of the chapter, right.
Okay, let's, let's start on the next chapter. Uh, the next chapter is about the philosophical ideas behind culture. <clears throat> Cognition and perception. It's more philosophical. It's kind of a fun chapter. <laughs> okay, you've got, a, you've got a dog, you've got a rabbit, and you've got a carrot. Which two go, go together? Dog, rabbit, carrot. Which go together? <laughs> The dog goes together with the rabbit, the carrot doesn't go with it. Because they're both... That makes sense. You want to put... Well, they're, they're, they're two mammals. So that's a possibility. Well, is it a red dog? Because it is, because that's You don't have to. I just pick it up. Now don't put it in the clean one. Put it in the... Take it outside. <laughs> No, it makes sense, because the dog and the rabbit are both mammals, right? And the carrot's a vegetable. I think it's a vegetable. Uh, is there any other way to put these <coughs> three things together? Rabbit and carrot. and the carrot, because rabbits eat carrots. Mm -hmm. And we can put the dog <laughs> together with the rabbit, because dogs eat rabbits. <laughs> but can we put the dog together with the carrot? Except in this picture. Does that fit? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it fits or not. Uh, when stimuli are grouped uh, according to the perceived similarity of their attributes, it is called taxonomic categorization strategy. It's how we put things together. You can put dog and, and rabbit together. You can put rabbit and carrot together. It's taxonomic. Uh, you're putting, and, and there's, a, there's a reason for it. The, you put the rabbit and the carrot together because the rabbits eat carrots. You put the dog and the rabbit together because they're both mammals. Or they're both al alive. Are carrots alive? Not after you pick them, I guess. They're not alive anymore. Taxonomic categorization answers are especially common among Westerners. We're really good at putting things together. That's what we're taught. I, actually, the SAT test has you putting things together. Uh, you, don't, you don't get to explain why you put it together that way, but the SAT test, the... Uh, uh, all of the achievement tests that you may be taking, we actually train you to put things together in this manner. And that is a very Western way of thinking. <laughs> it's part of our educational system. Thematic categorization uh, strategy is where stimuli are grouped together on the basis of causal, temporal, or spatial relationships. Uh, so you may put uh, the, the dog and the carrot together because they're the closest to each other and the rabbit's over here. So you may do that, or you may put the, well, uh, causal. Uh, the dog uh, attacks the rabbit, so you may put them together because the dog attacks the rabbit, or the rabbit eats the carrot. Uh, temporal, temporal, time, time, time. Temporal has to do with time. I can't think of an example that fits with rabbits and dogs and carrots. Thematic uh, categorization is especially common in East Asia. So whereas in the United States we're, we're always looking for uh, reasons to put two things together, in, in uh, Asia they're, they're, they, they want things to be in the same context. They, they're looking for context in order to put things together. This difference in categorization strategies reflects an underlying difference in the ways that people attend to their worlds. So they're always looking for context. We're always looking for things that are similar because we're Western. And our educational system is Western. Now one of the, uh, at the uh, positive things about tribal colleges is that uh, not all tribes uh, think in a Western manner. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, thinking in a lin linear manner, that everything, one thing follows the other. It's a linear, it's a linear concept. But uh, there are many American Indian groupings, uh, uh, groups of people that uh, think in more cyclical terms rather than linear things. One thing causes another thing. We don't forget this because everything comes back to the beginning. But as far as Western thought is concerned, everything is linear. So the past is the past. We don't, that's, it's gone, it's back there. We don't think of it that way. <clears throat> so you may be thinking more as the East Asians think, and that's okay because you're a different culture. Whoops. 
Analytic thinking is uh, characterized by a focus on objects and their attributes. Uh, objects are perceived as existing independently from their context. They are understood in terms of their component parts. Context is, is very important. So if you were trying to figure out how to put these windows up that they keep getting in our way, I know they keep driving us off into the mud. Here, we're going to build you this, this uh, walkway and then we're going to park a truck right in front of it so you have to walk around the truck to get through the mud to get to the walkway. They keep doing this to us, don't they? If you're walking from that, that direction to here. Uh, it's very irritating. And then they'll sit there on their truck and kind of look at you and dare you to cross in front of them. <laughs> I never do. I never do. I don't want to get in a fight with them. They're bigger than I am. Well, everybody's bigger than me. What am I talking about? And I'm carrying stuff, and I don't certainly don't want to hurt my camera. <laughs> so, the anal analytic thinking, we, we sep separate things from their context. Uh, we look at this uh, from uh, that point of view, from, from uh, the, that, uh, uh, that interesting idea. What, what, what was I watching last night? Passengers. I saw Passengers last night. It's the movie with uh, Jennifer Lawrence and uh, Pratt, Christopher Pratt, Chris Pratt, uh, where he, he uh, uh, <laughs> they're supposed to be a in suspended animation for, I don't know, 120 years, and he wakes her up because he thinks she's so cute. I think. Well, there must, maybe there was another reason. Maybe uh, he liked the way she talked on her whatever. Yeah. He almost committed suicide. It was really kind of, it was an interesting movie. But uh, we had to take everything out of context because he fell in love with this lady. Fell in love with her before he even met her. He fell in love with her, her, her uh, the way she talked and the way she acted on her, her interview or whatever it was. <clears throat> Took her completely out of context. And then he woke her up, uh, and of course she's, she was going to die before they got to wherever they were going. Homestead three, uh, 2. Uh, the attributes that uh, make up objects that are used as uh, basis for categorizing them and a set of fixed abstract rules is used to predict and explain the behavior of these objects, and that's analytic thinking. So people, uh, Western man is, uh, uh, performs analysis far more than Eastern man does. Uh, they take things out of, to, totally out of context. Uh, they make up abstract rules that uh, dictate what's going to happen next. That's not snow, that's rain. The guy came and looked at this. Well, you saw it. He came in here looking at it. <laughs> Will things change? Is somebody going to fix it? Holistic thinking is characterized by an orientation to the context as a whole. It represents an associative way of thinking which gives attention to the relations among objects and the surrounding context. So uh, the Eastern man uh, thinks in context. He thinks about context. He never th takes anything out of context. We as Western men, we take things out of context. We try to improve them. We try to, we try to come up with new ways of doing things. Uh, whereas Eastern man tries to improve on the context. He, he's looking more holistically at things, as confusing as all that is. And it's the difference between uh, holistic thinking and an analytic thinking. We're Western, so we're more analytic than, uh, than Eastern men. <coughs> in holistic thinking, objects are understood in terms of how they relate to the rest of the context, and their behavior is predicted and explained on the basis of those relationships. So you can't ever take anything out of, out of its context. Holistic thinking also emphasizes knowledge gained through experience rather than application of fixed abstract rules. Uh, so you're looking at what, what has happened to you in your life, and that is the context that uh, everything is judged from, whatever has happened to you in your life. I have a s former student from Bangladesh. His family has never left Bangladesh, but, uh, but Russell has... Uh, uh, actually been to the, lived in the United States for six years. Then he had to go back to Bangladesh because he lost his visa. Now he has come back to the United States. 
Uh, he had a very difficult time dealing with his family back in Bangladesh because their con they, everything was contextual. They, they uh, couldn't even conceive of, of uh, how people think in uh, the United States. They didn't care how people thought in the United States because their own experience is only, only has to do with Bangladesh. Now this gets really interesting because Russell's, he's a very romantic person and he wants to fall in love and have, and he wants to marry somebody, okay? Poor Russell. <laughs> he's not a bad looking guy, that's not his problem. His problem is that uh, because of his family, his family wants him to marry a, a woman from Bangladesh which is okay with him, he doesn't really care who he marries as long as it's, you know, female. That's all, that's the only criteria that he cares about. Uh, but they, it has to be somebody from Bangladesh. So while he's in the United States, he's not allowed to even date. So when they, they want to select somebody for his bride, they're looking at their own experiences. So they're trying to select him a bride that fits in what they think a, a, a bride should be. And of course, he's been to the United States, so if he actually marries somebody who's never been out of Bangladesh, and they, he brings them to the United States, they're going to be like a fish out of water. And that's not what he wants. Really kind of a fascinating situation. So he has actually changed his mindset from the Eastern way of thinking to the Western way of thinking. He doesn't want to marry somebody from Bangladesh. Doesn't want to marry somebody that's never been out of Bangladesh. Because they'll be, they, they won't understand him. His, his, uh, he has, now he has an analytic uh, mindset. He's, a, he's also a scientist, which makes it even more difficult. Um, he's actually studying psychology, but uh, he was a, uh, what did he study first? Computers, he's, he was a uh, computers major, and then he was an environmental science major. And now he's a psychologist. Fascinating, fascinating situation. And uh, he says, "I can't go. I can't go home." He had a birthright. He was supposed to inherit all this land because he was the eldest son. He was supposed to control his land, and he won't go back. So he's going to lose it all to his brother, his younger brother. As interesting as that is. Uh, so they're, they are more holistic. They think of experience as important, context is import, in, important, and as Westerners, of course, ana analysis is more important to us. Uh, analytic thinkers tend to show field independence. Uh, they separate objects from their background fields. Holistic thinkers tend to show field dependence. They tend to view objects as bound to their backgrounds. And of course, I showed you these two optical illusions. Uh, the picture on top is a picture of what? I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, it's Michael Jackson. Uh, this lady looks like she has no body. Well, of course she does. <laughs> it's behind the mirror. <laughs> and the mirror is showing, is showing the, the, the land that looks like she has no body. It's an optical illusion. Uh, another optical illusion. Uh, East Asians have been socialized from such a young age to attend to relationships that they do so unconsciously scanning <coughs> scenes. And so when they look at a scene, uh, they, they're looking for how things go together. We are looking at individual things. Westerners have been socialized to attend to focal objects, and they thus habitually tend to direct their attention at sub, such objects, whatever the focal object is. So this is an optical illusion to us as Westerners. Because we can't see her body. But if we were Easterners, we would know that her body is back there. And we wouldn't even think for an, a nanosecond that she didn't have a body. <clears throat> is the guy looking, uh, is, is, is he looking in profile or is he looking directly at us? This optical illusion only works for us. It only works because we're Westerners. If we were in, if we were in India, uh, they would look at this and they'd say, oh, don't be silly, he's looking directly at us. 
Can you see him looking uh, in profile? Nope, can't see it at all. They wouldn't see this as an optical illusion. But we, as because we're Westerners and we analyze focal, focal points, we uh, uh, analyze what we're supposed to analyze, what we think we're supposed to analyze, we can see both of them. Can't you? Can't you see him looking in profile and also looking directly at you? Of course you can. Looking at the art of East Asia, we, see, we can see that the art is very different from Western art. Not only are the people Asian, but uh, also they paint their pictures differently. East Asian art is painted from a, a, with a higher horizon, creating more context in the picture. In their portraits, the background is much more complex, and the figures in the painting are smaller than Western art. So in this picture, of course, this is a portrait of someone. There is a lot going on behind this individual. And that's a portrait. And we care about uh, what's going on behind her because we're Easterners. And we're looking at context. They put a high horizon so that we can see a lot of stuff behind there. The people in the picture aren't as important as where they are. Or maybe not. But they have a lot of context. And this is Chinese art. Uh, there's more Chinese art. As we can see, we have this lady, this is a portrait of the, of the young lady, but we also have just an intricate mass of stuff behind her. So there's a lot to look at in that picture. Uh, this is a painting, as you can see, we have a high horizon, and there's just, this is really involved, this is a really involved picture. Uh, this is from Japan, we see exactly the same thing. We see a lot of context. What's going on with, with these three individuals? Well, one of them, we can't even see their face, but they're all playing musical instruments. Here we have, uh, once again, we have a high horizon and just lots of stuff going on in that picture. Uh, here's a picture from the two famous pictures. And as we can see, Mona Lisa, not, do we really care what's going on behind Mona? Uh, no, <laughs> we don't care. Uh, the horizon, much, much lower here. Uh, what, we're, what we're focusing on is the, pic the people in the picture. Uh, we also have angels up in heaven. Uh, so we really don't look at the clouds. We don't even notice the trees. Uh, but this is Western art. And it's trying to, uh, Western painters try to focus, they try to for force you to focus on the per person in the center of the, of the, of the, uh, of the painting. They're trying to force you to do that. And we will. And then we, we work our way out. And as we work our way out, there's nothing back there. But we do see the angels, of course, and we do see all the other people. We're not exactly sure what's going on. Here's another. Here's an angel. Okay. Yeah. We've got just lots and lots of people. And with Mona Lisa, of course, we are focused on her smile. Oddly enough, they just came out came out with, somebody just wrote a paper about the fact that she's got you know, thyroid disease or something. I mean, it's really just <coughs> she's kind of puffy, you know. Her skin's kind of yellow. It's a painting, come on, let's get real. Masuda and Gonzalez and colleagues in 2008 had American and East Asian students draw landscapes with a person, a river, a tree, a house, and a horizon. I mean, you get this, this assignment all the time. Don't forget the river. Well, there's no river in this, these pictures. Uh, don't forget the tree. Uh, they were seeking to see the difference between the two groups. And this is what they saw with the Asian uh, landscape. East Asians drew a horizon that was significantly higher in, in the picture than it was for Americans. East Asians tended to provide a more complex background in their drawings. East Asians included 75% more contextual objects than did Americans. East Asians were more likely than Americans to situate their objects in context. And here we have, we have the human uh, right here, and of course, what's the most important thing in the picture? Well, we got a river, we got boats. Uh, on the on the river, we have trees, we have, and we have a background. We have context. They 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 created a lot more context than Americans did. We're going to talk about Facebook, and I know how important Facebook is to everybody. <clears throat> when East Asians take photographs of others, they tend to include more background in their pictures. 
Uh, they also tend to have smaller figures in their portraits compared to Americans. And these, of course, are two Japanese ladies that are supposed to look American for some reason. And I have no idea what that outfit is. But we're seeing just a lot of stuff back there. Uh, let's take a picture of the baby, okay, and the baby and the puppy, okay. Uh, and here we've got every, we got all this stuff back here that we're we're focusing on. Uh, let's take a picture of your girlfriend uh, brushing her teeth. Here we have her right in the middle of the picture, but we also see everything else behind this lady. We get to see everything. <clears throat> If I took this picture and I tried to put it on Facebook, people would complain, uh, why did you take a picture of all your cluttered stuff? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have friends that, that swear a lot. So. Uh, there we go. Uh, I know, let's take a picture of Susie with her ice cream cone. Well, we not only see Susie, but we also get to see everything in the... This is the, the kitchen, I think. Looks like the bathroom. Maybe it is the bathroom. What's she doing with an ice cream cone in the bathroom? <laughs> Susie. A picture from the United States. Uh, not a whole hell of a lot of context, is there? Just the kids. And of course, that's what we want to focus on, is our, is our favorite people of all time, our children. But uh, we know they're laying on grass, but that's about it. Uh, more pictures, school picture. We know there's a school bus back there, we can't see much of it. But the most important thing in this picture are the faces of the children. Uh, here we have barb a barbed wire fence. And that we'll, we'll call them cowboys since they all, all have cowboy, both have cowboy hats and cowboy boots on. And they must be in the United States because they have an American flag. I mean, not a whole lot of context. Not compared to the uh, Japanese photographs. Uh, a little bit more context here. They've got obviously they have children. I don't know why they have the notes on the on the door. There we go. They're on. They're going on a trip. I think they're going on a trip. <laughs> Either that, or they just murdered their neighbors and they put the bodies in the. No, <laughs> that would be silly. And especially taking a picture right in front of their garage. <laughs> Wait a minute. Right? It's the man that has the heavy one. That's right. <laughs> She's taller than he is, too, isn't she? She's kind of slumping down, so she's not as tall. That's interesting, isn't it? Huh. Of course, he gets the big she one. Shoes and the wet bag. And <laughs> Does that tell all just the ladies' clothes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of these bags is for these three, and the other three are for, yeah, okay, yeah. I got you, gotcha, okay. <laughs> when Masada and Gonzalez and colleagues in 2008 looked at American and East Asian Facebook pages, uh, they found that East Asian photos had smaller figures and larger backgrounds compared to American photos. Well, we do know that this lady's in the photograph, but uh, we see a whole lot of stuff uh, back behind her. <coughs> Uh, once again, two, two uh, photographs from Facebook pages. As we can see, we know where she, or you may guess where she is if you've ever been there. Uh, we know what the, the background is. We've got, we've got a pot here. We've got this chair here. Uh, this is bamboo. Uh, we get to see a lot of stuff. I don't have any idea why the ladies pulled her dress up. But it is a photograph, lots of context. We know she's in the middle of the street. Here this guy is on a motor scooter wondering why she's flat. She's, uh, what do they call that, mooning her. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and the other photograph. Uh, he's obviously a golfer because he has golf shoes on. <laughs> These are golf shoes, and that's a golfing hat. Anyway, much smaller uh, figures. Looking at Japanese photographs of buildings, researchers have discovered that these photographs have, have more boundary structures than American photographs. Uh, this is a picture of a building in Tokyo. And as you can see, we have lots of things uh, giving us context, lots of boundaries telling us where it is. Physical landscapes from Japan are literally busier than landscapes in the United States. 
And of course, this is uh, a temple in, in, the, in the autumn. Uh, this is an abandoned building, but you can see all the stuff back there. It's really kind of an interesting picture. There, there's my business in the middle of Tokyo. Okay, well, we have borders. Once again, we have borders uh, and uh, a lot of context. And the same way with this building. You may wonder why they built buildings like this. It's because they have to build up. They, there's not enough land to build up. That they decided to put buildings in. <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of really narrow buildings in Japan. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. As strange as that may seem, United States. There we go. Not a whole lot of context. Not a whole lot of boundary. Could be anywhere. This, of course, is the uh, is the national capital. That's a church. Uh, probably a uh, could be a Lutheran church. Could be a Presbyterian church with the high steeple. Uh, there are certain Protestant denominations that think the higher the steeple, the closer you are to heaven, the more likely God will hear your message. I know. Like, the, like your message goes up the steeple and then it pops out the top. And God goes, oh, I'll get this one. It's closer. There we go. Got another one. Okay, that's pretty good. That one's too low for me to get. I, I don't understand religions. Obviously, I don't understand religions. Uh, two more pictures. Uh, an old schoolhouse and uh, a building somewhere in the forest. I have no idea where that is. And there it's a Chrysler building. If you uh, watched, ever watch Passengers, the Chrysler building is very important in the movie. So take note, that's what the Chrysler building looks like. <laughs> uh, if you ever watched the movie Passengers. Uh, she said that she, what did she say? <coughs> She likes living in New York and looking at the Chrysler Building, is what she said. So he built a mock-up of the Chrysler Building and gave it to her. This is before he told her that, that he uh, had murdered her, was going to murder her, or had murdered her, because he woke her up. <clears throat> anyway, it's very romantic. As you can see, it's very romantic. Since cities in East Asia tend to be more crowded uh, than Western cities, uh, living in the busier physical environment fosters the ability, ability to attend to a lot more information at once. When they looked at uh, how scientists from East Asia present their findings on posters, uh, they had busier posters with more words than North American participants. I went to a conference in Vancouver. It was an international conference. We had uh, 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 psychologists from all over the world. Um, the, uh, some of them were Indian, we had Indian uh, uh, psychologists, we had Chinese uh, psychologists, a lot of American and Canadian psychologists. Uh, this is what an American poster would look like. Yeah, as you can see, it's kind of busy, a little bit busy, not too bad. But we'll wait until you see what the Chinese one looks like. <clears throat> That's what the Chinese poster looks like. I know, how'd you like to try to read that thing? You'd have to be standing there for like 15 minutes with your glasses on, and then maybe... A magnifying glass. A magnifying glass, exactly. <laughs> That's what they look like, as weird as that is. And it was funny because uh, people spent about the same amount of time in front of the uh, posters, but guess which poster they got more out of? Not this one. <laughs> uh, Researchers looked at government and university websites in East Asia and North America. The Asian websites were, more long, were much longer than the North American websites and had significantly more links and words. The East Asian websites were busier with more information for people to navigate. And of course, <coughs> it makes it really difficult to find what you're looking for since there's so much stuff there. Researchers discovered that Westerners were more likely to explain people's behaviors in terms of their underlying dispositions, while East Asians had, po had and possibly people from other cultures, of course, were more likely to exp explain people's behaviors in terms of contextual variables. Okay, so I've got, uh, this is a cartoon. Uh, dispositional attribution, uh, here's my assignment, so late, you lazy bum. And here is the situational attribution. Uh, my assignment so late may be a family issue. This is the way Westerners would think. 
I wonder why this is the, why they're so late with their stuff. And this is the way Asians would think. So if you've ever had, have you ever had an Asian uh, instructor or professor or teacher or anything? Have you ever run into these people? I have, in Crown Point. Oh, okay. Oh, in Crown Point? Mm -hmm. Okay. Were they flexible? Was there any flexibility to this individual? <laughs> Uh, we had a, uh, when, I, when I was working in Fort Belknap, we had a, uh, a lady from Korea who was our math teacher. And uh, one, one semester, she flunked everybody. She flunked everybody. So in order, well, I mean, you can't graduate without college algebra. So uh, what the uh, dean of, of uh, students, uh, not the dean of students, dean of academics had to do, she had to go back over all of her stuff and decide which students should have passed and which students shouldn't have passed. Her problem was if somebody was late, she took off, she, she didn't count it. She wouldn't allow them to turn anything in late. Um, it's coming to me, I think I'm guessing. Uh, what was another problem she had? Uh, annotations, uh, if you didn't put in a minus, a plus, or a multiplication or a division, you know, if you just assume that everybody knew what was going on, she didn't count that. Uh, you had to show all of your work. If you didn't show some of your work, she gave you, she gave you a zero or not. I know. Whether you got it right or not didn't really make any difference. Anyway, she was kind of an interesting lady. Uh, the next semester, she was a little bit more flexible, and by the time uh, I left, she was uh, even more flexible because she had learned that she either did this or she was going to, to lose, uh, to have to leave. The problem was she was on, uh, here on a, uh, a work visa, and if uh, they fired her, then she'd have to go back to Korea. That was a problem. So she got kind of flexible. She got more flexible. She, they, they forced her into flexibility, but it really bothered her a lot. Uh, she didn't want to be this person. She wanted to be this person. And she said, they'll never make it in the real world. Like Fort Belknap is not the real world. Montana is not the real world. What do you think? When people from India and the United States were asked to describe a person, the Americans were more likely to describe people in abstract personality traits, and Indians describe people in concrete behaviors that they observe. She is friendly. Uh, she brings cake to my family on festival days. Uh, that would just be an, an example of somebody from India. <clears throat> So we think of people as, as, we try to figure out who they are. We try, we try to analyze people and figure out who they are. We're going to talk about murder in just a second. Right now. Uh, researchers analyzing news stories of murders in the United States, China, and Japan discovered that East Asian papers described the murders in situational terms. The murderer had a rivalry with another student. They had been recently fired. They never look at their personality. They never talk about their personality. In the United States, we're still trying to figure out why that guy shot up uh, the, uh, the concert in Las Vegas. We want to know what's wrong with that guy. But we're Americans. That's why we want to know that. If we were from India, we wouldn't care. If we were from, from China, we wouldn't care why he did it, what was going on in his mind. We would, we would try to create a... a uh, contextual situation uh, to explain what was going on. The American reports tried to interpret the situation from a disp uh, dispositional point of view. The murderer had a very bad temper. The sh shooter was described as mentally unstable. We see that a lot in our news stories. So in the United States, we want to know why. We want to stop this guy from doing it again. In Asia, they don't care that much. They look at things in context. We look at things uh, in, as far as the situation is concerned. We try to analyze the situation. That's why if you become a profiler for the FBI, if you become a profiler for the FBI, one of the things you, that you will do is you'll try to figure out who this person is and how we can, we can recognize them next time. Well, the 18,000 rounds of ammunition might have helped, he carted it. <laughs> Why do you need all these these bullets in your in your room? I don't know. Why did he need all those? Well, he's going to shoot them all. That's one one of the reasons. Why do you need all these bump stuff? Is it like um, is it, is it 
seems like it, it tells you that it happens more here. Oh, well. Is it, um, or is it, is it just as bad in Asia as it is here? No, they don't have. So could that be the reason why we're so interested in why people <coughs> Well, we do look at people as individuals. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you're probably right. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, in Asia, of course, you wouldn't do, you wouldn't, the mass murder is very uncommon because it's a, an embarrassment to your family. In the United States, nobody cares. We're individuals. Yeah, what I do doesn't reflect back on my grandfather. Yeah. Yeah, because you see the, the shooter, like the combat shooter, they, the mother is actually starting to speak out now. Right. And at first she was afraid, but speaking on behalf of what her son did. It's, exactly. It's, it's, it's like, um, yeah, just wanting to learn more, I think that's why, because how to, how to minimize it is what's how you see it. But in, like you said, in Asia, it's just like, maybe how to read signs, people will say, you know that. Right. Yeah. We know they're not going to do that. Yeah. They do what they, they're supposed to do. Yeah. yeah. We don't. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we just do whatever the hell we want to do. So, if there's that murder in, like, Asia, do you think they talk, you said they don't talk about what was going on with them. They just think that oh, this person got fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, yeah. They're, like the uh, lady at uh, Walgreens in Connecticut was it Massachusetts. It was in Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, she went in there and shot people up, and, and uh, the reason was because she was had just been fired. Uh, but she was only a I'm sorry. Wasn't was she only a ten? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I. I remember reading about this. It's, it's, it's left the news because of Brett Kavanaugh. It's Brett Kavanaugh's fault. Everything is Brett Kavanaugh's fault at this point, so this is something you need to be aware of. <laughs> I, I mean, it was, it was on the news for, what, two days, and then all of a sudden it, was, it disappeared? They weren't talking about it uh, locally, and they, there wasn't anything on CNN about this lady shooting the place up. Yeah. She wounded, what, seven? She killed three? And that doesn't include herself. We have stopped including the per if they commit suicide, we don't count them as as one of the deaths anymore. Now we say, well, they she shot shot and killed three, and uh, then committed suicide. Well, isn't that four? But we're we're trying to lower the numbers. For some reason, we're trying to lower the number by one. <laughs> so they don't, they don't count the yeah, it yeah, doesn't count. Not anymore. It, it all of a sudden, it's like they stopped counting the uh, the so suicide. Is, is that four more? Is that what it is? Uh, is yeah, I think it's four. Five? Maybe three. Well, four, I guess. I think it's four more. Yeah, four is a good number. Personality information is not seen as equally important for explaining the behaviors of others in all cultural contexts. Westerners tend to use personality information more for understanding others and themselves, of course, than do East Asians. So they don't even look at personality. And the reason they may not look at personality is because they're more holistic, is because they're more collectivistic. And if uh, you are a member of a group, the assumption is that you have the same personality as everybody else. If you come from a select family, that means that you have this personality. So they don't see it as we do as Americans. Uh, if you have a family of, of uh, three kids, uh, you know in the United States, we see each of those kids as not only individuals, but they probably have very different personalities. That's the way we read things. But in Asia, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't read it that way at all. If uh, this person is a Kennedy, then this person acts just like JFK. Uh, that's just the way it is. Um, because they are more holistic and more collectivistic. Uh, people from many other non-Western cultures show a pattern of focusing on si situation rather than disposition, similar to the East Asians. And I don't know why I put this joke up here, but uh, it's kind of funny. <laughs> I, th I feel like juggling machetes. <laughs> and of course this says absolutely no machete juggling. <laughs> The essence of human nature. But this is really kind of interesting because this is only the essence of human nature in the United States. It's not the essence of human nature in Asia. So the, the vast majority of people in the world don't have these attributes that we have. We are different because we're Westerners. And religion comes in. This is so much fun. I love talking about religion. 
Uh, religious groups uh, differ in their attributions as well. American Protestants are more likely than American Catholics to make dispositional uh, attributions. Uh, this difference between sects appears to be a function of Protestants uh, having a greater commitment to the idea that people have individual souls. So if you're dealing with somebody who, and I, I used to live in Omaha. Omaha is 80% Catholic. That was a real shock to me. It was a real cultural shock to me because I grew up in a town that was Methodist. So everybody was Protestant. So all the, all the kids that I had anything to do with were Protestant. So when I went to Omaha and started coaching soccer in, in Omaha, it was a totally different situation. These kids were far more collectivistic than the kids that I had grown up with. And it, it was because they were less, in, uh, they were, uh, less individualistic. <clears throat> Um, I, I had some kids that uh, were really good soccer players uh, and of course I'm bringing them along and I'm hoping they'll play on my team when I, I, I coached the high school team in, uh, in one of the small towns around uh, Omaha um, and I was hoping, you know, I brought these kids along and they had always played for me and I thought they were loyal to me uh, but I'll tell you what, once the church said, come here, come play for us, you're really good. I like the way you play. They went with. They went to, to their church. They went. They went to church schools. They left me. They left me. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to play against those damn kids. And I'll tell you, they were really good. I'd really trained them really good. And I wish they played for me. But of course, they were more loyal to their church than they were to the guy that taught them how to play. Does that seem right to you? They should have played for me. Don't you think they should have played for me? No, no they went to parochial school. I had, to, I had to knock heads with these kids over and over and over again. Ah, it was terrible. <laughs> Jesus is coming. Get busy. <laughs> I mean, that's hilarious. If people believe that people are judging them on the basis of what their souls has soul has done, it follows that they are more likely to view the soul as being the cause of the individual's behavior. And so uh, because the United States is primarily Protestant, we have this idea that the individual is the, uh, is, is the reason that these people are doing what they're doing. Okay, so it's more disposition than anything else. And of course the Protestant religion is that way. The Protestant religion tells you that that, uh, that you have to do good work in order to go to heaven. That's what it tells you. It, it creates a, a, uh, the, indiv the uh, individual as an individual. Uh, in Catholicism, of course, it's the community. If the community is bad, everybody has to go, doesn't get to go to heaven. If the priest makes a mistake and doesn't force people to be good Catholics, uh, then potentially uh, there, there are lots of people that will go, go to hell. Uh, but as far as Protestants are concerned, you have to do good work yourself in order to uh, go to heaven. People's socioeconomic status predicts the kinds of attributions that people make. Working class Americans make more situational attributions and fewer dispositional attributions than middle class Americans. <clears throat> uh, so uh, working class people in the United States are more uh, collectivistic and middle class Americans are more individualistic, as interesting as that is. The same kind of class differences in uh, explaining other people's behaviors has been found in France. So the working class people in France are one way and the middle class people are more individualistic. The same kind of class differences in explaining other people's behaviors have been found in Russia so we have Russia and France and the United States with the same mindset. The same kinds of class differences in explaining other people's behavior has been found in India. Now India has what they call the caste system. And they have like 250 different castes. And the idea is that you're supposed to marry inside your caste. This is a hierarchy. It's a hierarchy, so you're not supposed to marry somebody from a higher caste. You're supposed to stay within your caste. Now remember, there's 1.2 billion people, 
1.3 billion people in India. <clears throat> so 250 castes is that you still have a lot to choose from. Now it, it's 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 the opposite. Uh, your your uh, your tribe uh, has the clan system, and you have to marry outside your clan. There's no hierarchy. You have no hierarchy. One clan is not better than the other, right? Or did I make that up? Is one clan better than the other? No. <laughs> puncher. Puncher again. <laughs> but in India, it is. I mean, it's a caste system. So if you're, if you're one of the lower castes, you can't marry somebody that's from a higher caste. So how do they keep track of it? I'm sorry? How do they keep track of it? Oh, it's easy. It's easy. You're born into a family, and the family is from this caste because the mother and the father are from that caste. So you know what your caste is because you know what your mother and your father are. Right? So when I start to date somebody, and I'm from a select caste, I, you know, I, and I go on the internet to find you know, a bride, I go to that caste. I don't go to, a, I don't go to the higher caste. Oh, my goodness gracious, I never did that. I don't do that. I don't. There's still there's still there's still arranged they're they're still doing arranged marriages and, and stuff like that in India. Yeah, there probably are some. Just like there's some people in the Air Force, I mean in the military, who fraternize. You know that that's against the law. Article thirty seven. Officers will not fraternize with enlisted personnel. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. But it still happens, doesn't it? I'm a criminal. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped casts. And one of us had to get out of the service. I did. I got her. She made more money than I did anyway. That's what we're after, the bucks. And we're still together 40 years later, even though everybody said I was marrying her for her money. <clears throat> Obviously. Well, I won't tell you what I married her for, but it wasn't her money. <laughs> if analytic thinkers uh, tend to view the world as operating to a set of universal abstract rules and laws, they will apply these rules and laws when trying to make sense of a situation. This is termed rule-based reasoning, and that's what we have in the United States. Uh, we think of physics and we think of rules. We think of mathematics and we think of formulas. We are rule-based. We drive down the road and uh, I keep asking you guys, how fast can I drive? Because it's rule-based. The, the street sign says 55 miles an hour, but I know you guys are driving faster than that because everybody and their cousin is passing me. Even in those old trucks that rattle and drive sideways. <laughs> They're going 75 miles an hour, and they know they're passing me. So, but it's rule-based. So there has to be a rule as to how fast I can potentially go, right? And how fast is that? You guys haven't told me yet. I, I, I was going 75 the other day. <laughs> between, between, Navajo, between Navajo and the lake, I was going 75 miles, 5 miles an hour. 80 and, 80 and 90. 80 and 90? Right there? Or oh, just right there. When I get close to Window Rock, I slow down. I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. That's, where the, that's the only place there are any cops. Right there between Navajo and, uh, and, Win and Fort Defiance. Remember this. It's the only place you see the cops. You know you post these videos on YouTube. Uh, one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> Holistic thinkers should be more likely to make sense of the situation by considering the relationships among objects and events. Uh, so they're trying to find, they're trying to create context. That's what they, they want to, uh, to see if they're going to analyze anything. Uh, they should look for evidence of events clustering together such as similarity among events or of temporal con con contiguity uh, of events. This is termed associative reasoning. Now, once upon a time there was a uh, Dashiell Hammett uh, wrote about Charlie Chan. And Charlie Chan was a, was a, was a detective in, in, Hawaii, in Honolulu. 
And the reason that he solved so many crimes was because he was always looking for contacts. He was always doing this. Evidently, Dashiell Hammett understood. I think his name was Dashiell. No, it's Biggs. The guy's name was something Biggs. The guy that wrote Charlie Chan. It wasn't Dashiell Hammett. It was Biggs. Uh, what was the first name? I can't remember. Westerners appear to have change, uh, to view change as occurring in linear ways. Change appears in static and predictable ways. Stocks uh, rise after an election. Stocks will rise in 2020. We know that. Oh, stock market just crashed last yesterday. Did you see that? It went down 800 points yesterday. Don't worry, Donald Trump said that this was normal. <laughs> he talks about everything <laughs> like he knows. East Asians believe that change happens in fluid and unpredictable ways. So if we were Asian, we would see things in a different manner. And this is one of the reasons why Charlie Chan was able to solve those crimes because he looked at things in context and Westerners look at things in a linear fashion. They look at, uh, they, they separate things out and sometimes they don't go to get, they can't, they don't, aren't putting things together. They're taking little pieces of information out and they're looking at this piece of information, they're looking at this piece of information and they can't solve the crime. But Charlie Chan goes in and he looks at this piece of information, this piece of information, and he puts it in context so he's able to solve the crime. That's old Charlie or new Charlie or whatever. Did you ever see any of those Charlie Chan, Chan movies? Pretty good stuff. I know. The inscrutable Asian. Charlie Chan. <clears throat> Let me tell you a story. Let me see if I have time. Do I have time? Maybe. No, don't have time. Next time we'll start out with a story about the Chinese farmer. Fascinating guy. Was a very typical Asian. <laughs> so we'll start.